Hey there, welcome to this episode of the Life and Money Show brought to you by Good Egg Investments. I'm Annie Dickerson. And I'm Susan Elliott. Annie, tell us what's on your mind. Oh man, today I'm feeling contemplative because over the weekend, um, we just went to see Inside Out 2. Oh my goodness, my kids were blown away. But there's one scene in the movie that I've been replaying in my head over and over because it's helping me to work out something with my own emotions and how I process things and see the world. Okay, so this don't worry for anybody who hasn't seen the movie. This isn't going to spoil it for you. This is just one lone Good. scene in the in the whole movie. Um, okay, so there's a new care. There's a, a few new emotions in Inside Out Two. One of which is anxiety, and this is a big one. And so there's one part in the movie that you really get to see exactly how anxiety works. So joy and some of the other emotions are in, I think they're in imagination land. And they're like, oh, this is cool. This is where the pillow forts are. And this is where this is. And that is. And then um, they're like, but wait, what's that little light over there? And they go into this like secret little area, this little secret fort. And they see it's set up almost like a call center with all these little like little minions working at their little cubicles right and up on the screen is anxiety from headquarters and she's like okay we need more projections we need more we need more 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 and all these little minions down there they're like they're at their desks and they're basically sketching up these potential scenarios of what could go wrong and then the projections are projected up onto the screen, which goes into Riley, the main characters, into her head. And so anxiety's like, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. She could fail at this. She could fail at that. Yeah, keep it going. Keep it going. And so it's oh, all no. of these. It's basically taking your imagination and turning it against you. And yeah. instead of using your imagination like we did as kids for all the playful things and building things, it's like now taking that same power of imagination and turning it into something that's just like all the things that could possibly go wrong. Wow. Just the fact that it's housed in the imagination center is like it's not housed in like the fact truth center of our brain. Yeah. No, no, just like we think anxiety is coming from that like yep. this is true, this is real, this could happen. It's like wait, wait, wait. It's in the imaginations. I feel like as an adult just seeing that you're like that's a mind-blown moment of like, "Oh, wait a minute." Like imagination like the the stuff the other stuff in the imagination zone is just fantastical like the cloud guys i remember from the first one right. where they just like blew them away and then it was like oh no there goes the cloud guys or french fry <laughs> forts and stuff but there's yes. the anxiety right there too oh yeah i know and it's it it helped me really and i'm still this is why i'm contemplative because i'm still thinking about it because for me my own personal experience of anxiety is often it comes up in the most like blue sky of days like you know when there's nothing going on and i'm like i should feel perfectly fine and this anxiety comes up in me i'm like what is that about? I don't even, I don't even know. And I think there's like this, um, this barrier between me and the anxiety. And it's like, what is it about? I don't even know. So just thinking about the projections, I'm like, oh, that's probably happening on some level, whether it's conscious or not. Like my mm -hmm. mind is probably creating those scenarios and either I'm suppressing them or burying them or I'm not connecting them with, in some way, but still they're creating this sense of dread inside me. And then what happens in the movie is, so one of the little minions steps away and then Joy comes in. She's like, no, Riley needs some positive projections too. So she's like drawing things that are, you know, the hockey team winning or people high-fiving her, people coming in for a group hug. And it's it's combating that anxiety because then anxiety is like, wait a second, what are all these positive things? We need more negative things. And Joy's like, no, we need good things. And so in some way, I'm like, oh yeah, I do have some agency in this situation. When there's that sense of dread and anxiety, I can come in and I can bring in the positive possibilities as well. It's like training your inner joy 
sort of captain. She, what is she? She's yeah. like the leader of the team. Like yeah, it's not just, right. it's like a little person. I, okay, Joy, I need you. I need you to whip up some visualizations right now because anxiety is going crazy. But I had a question that came up. So when, when do you experience money anxiety? Is there any time in your daily kind of existence, your daily routines, that sort of thing where money anxiety specifically comes up? Oh, I mean, money anxiety is very, it's something I've done a lot of work on. Um, and it's something that does come up for me fairly, you know, fairly regularly, I would say anytime I'm spending money, thinking about it, anytime I'm only a stone's throw away from my phone at all times. And I pull up my phone and suddenly I'm on, on, on I'm on Amazon trying to order something that maybe I need or don't need. And then I go through all the emotions. I'm like, do I really need this? Oh, maybe I don't. I need to save up for this. I feel guilty. I feel shame that I'm looking at this right now. And so there's a lot. I think it's not just anxiety, but there's so much wrapped up in money and finances. And that's exactly what we're going to dive into today. And I'm curious mm. to hear your perspectives on it too. Um, but before we dive in, um, just a quick reminder to the listener. We're so grateful you're here. And if you're listening to this, you probably know that community is such a key component of building wealth and investing and learning about finances, which is all everything we're going to talk about here on this show today. But if you're looking for a community to help you to learn and to grow and to invest, particularly in real estate, which is what we focus on, you are invited to join the Good Egg Investor Club. It's a community of people just like you who are looking to build wealth for their families through investing passively in real estate. To do that, you can go to goodegginvestments.com slash invest. All right. With that, Susan, let's dive into the core of our conversation today, which is a huge topic. We're talking about this huge wealth transfer, this transition of money um, from traditionally a male-dominated world of finances and money to where more and more women are taking the lead, taking the reins, taking the control in finances and money, both within their households as well as personally. And it's a huge, huge shift. So I just wanted to ask you first and foremost, have you seen this um, out in the world? Have you heard about this with friends, with family? Um, how has it impacted your life? I think as I've become like a, a financial adult, which is a great term, I think we need to embrace more. And and it took me, you know, through my 20s, which I think is probably pretty normal um, to realize that like, oh, I have to like manage this. I have to get on top of this. And and I think that my as I've done that, I've got married. I'm I am for sure the CFO of our family. Um, I'm training my husband up on the accountant position. It's open, open for, <laughs> open for jobs. So, um, so he's he's doing a lot of that stuff. But I'm the one making the high level decisions, and and we just defaulted into that because I'm the mm. one that thinks in that way. Um, and as I talk to more of my friends, it turns out that a lot of the females, at least in sort of a heterosexual relationship, are the ones that are thinking about finances or that are managing their money in a certain way. And it has, I have thought, I remember thinking to myself, like, interesting, because when we went and saw that initial financial advisor, they were talking to Adam. They weren't talking to me the whole time. And when I think about like when I look at sort of investing images and products and, you know, your typical stock market and it's just a bunch of white males and suits with a token female in there. Right. And and so there's this this like interesting. That's not my experience in reality, but I have such a small sample size that it's easy for all of us to think that like, oh, maybe you know, this is just me, or maybe this isn't the norm, but it's true. I mean, the statistic that this article that were, were kind of really piqued Annie and I's interest here is that among married women, 30% more of them were making financial and investment decisions in 2020 compared to just five years earlier, a 30% increase in just five years um, as of recently. And that's a huge, just 
you know, a statistic that points to that women are taking on the reins of making the financial decisions in their, in their families and married couples at least. And what yeah. about you? How did, did you always feel like a CFO boss or is it, is it <laughs> just recently? <laughs> No, definitely not. Definitely the opposite of that situation. Um, I, you know, I, I grew up learning to save. My parents taught me to save. That was really like the key lesson. If I can master just that mm -hmm. one thing, they were like, yep, you've got the whole money game. Um, so when I got married, it was really, my husband knew more about money and finances at that time than I did. And I was totally fine with that. I was like, I don't even care to learn. I think partly because I was intimidated by it. And I there was just so much other things I wanted to focus on in my young adult life, like climbing the corporate ladder, thinking about having kids and buying a house. Things like that were more on my mind. The money was really kind of just, at that time at least, it was a tool to get to some of those things. But I wasn't really thinking about long term or I wasn't thinking about it that it would be possible to retire early. I was just like, let me just try to create a comfortable situation here while checking off some of my life goals. Um, and money was always in the background, but I had a similar experience where we went to talk to um, a financial advisor and I'm like, hello, I'm over here too. I <laughs> I'm in the room. Is it just the two of you guys or or do I get to make any decisions? And there were some things that, you know, I didn't fully understand, but I also didn't feel very comfortable in that environment when it was it seemed like kind of a bro environment. I didn't I didn't feel comfortable to ask those questions. And so I just kind of nodded and smiled and I was like, "Yep, yep, okay." And then later we got home and I'd ask my husband all the questions. <laughs> and yeah. so that was definitely more my experience. Um, but it's so, gosh, it feels so good to know, one, that this is happening, that more women are taking control, that my, uh, women are making more money than ever before. There are more women in the workforce. There are more women starting businesses and in general, just out in the world. And so it's, it's very exciting to see that. And it's, I don't know what the word for it is, but it's, I guess it's, it, it normalizes my experience to know that I'm not alone in sitting in that room with a financial advisor and feeling like, Ugh, I don't belong here. I, you know, I'm out of my league. I shouldn't be here. But knowing that it's not me, it's not me. The system was not designed for people like me. And that's something that's thankfully it's changing now. People are learning more how to connect with women and to advise women, to support women as they take more control of their finances. Um, but it just helps to know that, oh, thank goodness, there wasn't something wrong with me that I didn't know the answers to all those questions or I didn't feel like I belonged in that room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's like there's some catching up to do. Like all of a sudden women are becoming leaders in the in the home in terms of finances, whether they make more, they manage it, they are the ones who who decide. And I mean, I, th I think that's too, like I ignored it for a while too. I was a saver, which means I didn't accrue a lot of debt, thankfully, but I was not, I did not understand investing. I, I mean, I had a, even a vague sense of budgeting. I definitely got surprise expenses, like yearly stuff that I just couldn't plan for very well. And I got to a breaking point, speaking of like my little anxiety center and my imagination went haywire. I mean, it was like financial anxiety took over that anxiety center. It was like, it was like all the little minions were like, oh, money. Yeah. <laughs> she really likes these money anxiety projections. Which one right. can we do? Can we say like she loses everything? Can we say that she needs her parents again? Can we say she has to move home? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Show that one. Show that one. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so I, I like took things over at that point where I think that was my nature of like, we've got to like take this and run with it and have a plan and invest. And so I think that's how I stepped into that role. But um, but yeah, as, as more women are, are continuing to like step into this role, 
the industry has to like step up to help us in different ways. And I just love that like there is this acknowledgement of that like things can we can look at money and investing and finances differently. And it and it maybe it's a sort of the feminine side of our brain, maybe it's a masculine side of our brain that has been dominating it before. And I say that specifically because you know, it's not just a gender thing too. I, I think there's a, probably a lot of men out there who don't see money and finances the same way as other men, because maybe they look at it through a different lens that maybe would categorize as feminine. I, for example, like looking at the emotions behind investing and how that drives our behavior and our behavior drives our actions and our actions drive the results. So if we're looking, if we're ignoring the emotion side of it, that was like taking a huge piece of that puzzle away and it may not have fit together for people in the past. And certainly like for a lot of women, I think they need to understand those, those elements of, of money. And um, yeah. And, and supposedly this is going to get easier for all of us. Yeah, I certainly hope so. And I, I think you're absolutely right that there's, I mean, different strokes for different folks, right? Everybody learns differently, but that I think that's the exciting part of where we are now. I mean, look at us talking about money and emotions on a podcast, right? Here we are in our home studios recording this and anybody in the world could find it and listen to it. And if it resonates with them, then they could start to learn about money and finances with us. They can go back and listen to previous episodes. They can follow along as we have more conversations. This type of medium wasn't available 10, 15, mm. 20, 50 years ago for people to learn. And, you know, know, especially, you know, the, the only options back then were you go into a financial institution like a bank where everybody's dressed up in a suit and there's these closed doors offices and you go in and it's very sterile and you sit in a chair, your husband sits in a chair and you sit across from somebody on a computer and it's a very sterile environment and it's not very comfortable. You're very intimidated. Whereas with something like this or an online course or a blog or a video, you can listen to it while you're folding your laundry, while you're making lunch for your kids. And that's how I learned about real estate investing was I listened to a lot of podcasts. And it was a lot of male voices at the time, especially. But I found that it was something I had never had before because prior when I was trying to learn about real estate investing, I was doing it through books and maybe occasionally I'd, you know, try a course or something, but it just never hit home with me until I started listening to these casual podcast conversations where I heard people talking about it in ways that it made sense to me. And because it was so many different voices and different perspectives, my brain could start to piece them together in a way that made sense for me. And I think that's what's so exciting about where we are is that women are so poised to take control, take over, and to make this transition. And there's more resources and support now for women than there ever has been before. And you can really choose exactly what your journey, what your learning journey will look like. Mm -hmm. That you touched upon a couple of things that um, that are these elements of what women need in the financial world that are are like community and building confidence are two of those. And I think about the podcast formatting and it does feel like a little bit more of a community. We're, t we're here with you, the listener, to be able to help you interpret your own feelings and behavior around money and life, right? Because we're connecting those two. So you're able to find people and really like get to know them, you know, for us, you can come onto our website. You can actually join us in person for meetups each week um, to be able to talk to people in a really casual atmosphere. There's ways that you can find community that are like more approachable than sitting in your financial advisor's office, for instance. And then just like building confidence, these little tiny drip feeds of, of education and not just the like very financially minded education, but, but all encompassing of like how we are with money, how our behaviors kind of, you know, even like our past, our childhood exposure to money and how that is impacting our current finances and our scenario. There's, there's just so much learning out there. And those are two of the many things that, that, um, 
that experts have said that women need more of to be able to have the confidence to move into positions of controlling more finances and um, and to move into that. Yeah, I mean, it used to be that the person who had the education, who knew the financial wisdom and had that knowledge, they were the holders of the power. They sat on their ivory throne and you had to go to them and you had to ask them to get the key to the financial success in your life. And that's no longer the case. And there's knowledge and wisdom and advice all over the place. The hard part is now sifting through that to find the people mm -hmm. that you can most relate with and who resonate best with you. But the information is out there. And so in many ways, the power has shifted. It's no longer with that one person who holds all the power and the, the the wisdom, but it's in your own fingertips. And it's really of, you know, you taking the time to go and find the information. And so when I, I would, I used to go, every time I'd walk the dog, I'd be listening to real estate podcasts. And I wasn't, at first, I didn't have that community around me. And so I'd, I was really only listening to the podcast. So it was really only one way. It was uh, you know, just inbound. No, <laughs> I wasn't going outbound with any of my information and talking to people about it. But it gave me this incubation period where I was just processing and processing this information and it was circling around in my head and I was making more and more sense of it. So by the time that I went to my first real estate conference, I felt pretty confident that I knew more or less the questions to ask and how to talk about uh, what I wanted to talk about. And so I think for women, especially when you might be, you know, you're feeling that fear or the, you know, the guilt and the shame about maybe not doing more and not um, doing more with your money sooner, um, you know, having this, the power to educate yourself and then go out and ask those questions and make those meaningful, um, those meaningful decisions and take those actions. I mean, I think it makes all the difference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, and it makes me think of like, that's actually probably one of the reasons why this transition is happening is because of the change in media, the change in education formats that's happened even since 2020, where all of a sudden we're doing more online. And the, the rise of podcasts, for instance, the rise of just like, outsourcing, not outsourcing, but spreading out that knowledge, that ability to share and educate. And like you said, it does bring its own challenges of sifting through it all. But that I think is empowering more women to be able to say, I think I know more, or I'm able to learn more. I'm able to learn, educate myself in the ways that feel good to me that, you know, are answering my own questions. Um, another element that that was cited that what women need more of is just honest conversations about the emotions around in finance and investing. And we've said that already, but the fear, the shame, the guilt, the anxiety, our little anxiety control centers and figuring out those stories that are being told so that you can break them down and say, oh, that's just in my imagination center. That's not part of fact or truth about who I actually am and my identity. Um, and I think, you know, being able to connect all of that back to money, it's no longer a separate thing, um, is I think part of the reason why we're seeing the confidence increase where women can say like, yeah, I'm going to make more money. I'm going to buy that house among solo households, more women own homes than men right now, which is in incredible. So like real estate investing is becoming more confident for women. It's just, it's an exciting space to be in because and I, I love that this article brought this home. And, and this is something I heard from my early days of investing in real estate because I was attracted to the female thought leaders in this or in this. I was attracted to you and Julie, for instance, in the beginning when I started learning about real estate investing and this podcast. But they say that women controlling more cash might just change the world. And I, I think about that as kind of my grounding, you know, just like what we do with our money and how we think about the impact we want to have on our families and our communities. And not to say that men don't have these same thoughts and things, but that, you know, I think just by the maternal nature, especially of being a mother for me and caring for the survival and, you know, 
the, the of an of a young new human into this world and wanting them to be able to have what they need to be able to confidently move forward all of these things like it makes me want to think about where i'm putting my money and maybe a little bit differently and i think that's the change that they're referring to what would you annie what would you kind of think about how how this shift is impacting kind of globally if women controlled more of the capital in the world yeah, I think you're spot on that there's so much more community. Women, you know, studies have shown time and again when 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 women learn a new skill, they change and transform an entire community because then they go and they teach it to their kids, they teach it to their spouse, they teach it to their friends. And suddenly you have this this natural wave of change because women always love to share. And so that's a huge one. I think bringing money out into the open and talking about it and not making it so taboo. I mean, even, you know, I'm a money professional. Like this is what I do. I do finances and real estate investing. And even when I get together with my friends, I feel a little awkward bringing in mm -hmm. the money into the conversation. So I know if I'm feeling that way, everybody else must be feeling that way too. And so I think this, this transition, this wave will start to bring money into the light a little bit more rather than in the dark corners where it's been for so many generations, but bringing it out into the open a little bit more. And that makes it not so scary of a topic. And it also makes us all feel a little bit less alone in the money worries and the money stresses that we may be experiencing. And I think that makes a huge difference on an emotional and a spiritual level. Level. And then I think, you know, as they say, money doesn't change who you are, it amplifies who you are. And so, you know, I, I know so many women who have this just hunger for impact, and they want to make a difference in the lives of their families, their kids, but also their communities. And I think the more that we can empower women, um, with that financial education and equip them to make take these actions, the more that it's going to um, have that ripple effect. And it reminded me of one exercise I want to leave the listener with. Um, and this is a kind of a, this is not from inside out, but this is something that I learned many years ago, actually from a podcast. Um, at a critical juncture when I was making a big decision in my life. And you can use this exercise for anything, especially if it relates to um, something you're feeling anxious about or fearful about or unsure about. So it can be something as small as, you know, wanting to buy something that you're not sure if you should spend the money on or buying that house, something bigger, right? Or making that first investment, um, something that can be very scary. And so the basic premise is you're going to take a sheet of paper and it has to be a sheet of paper. Okay. Don't just do this in your head because these things are swimming in your head all the time. What about my notes the app? <laughs> That could work as long as you're getting it out of your head and into something that mm -hmm. you're looking at. Okay, fine. I'll take notes mm -hmm. app or, <laughs> you know, Google doc, something like Nothing's that. Nothing's nice about writing things down. Yes. So it's, it's true. Sometimes paper. Mm -hmm. Yes. Take your paper, whether physical or virtual, you're going to divide it into three parts and um, they're, the three parts are going to be fears, opportunities, and strengths. And so let's say, for example, you're feeling anxious about making your first investment. And so first, you're going to list all your fears. Those are going to come easy. That's from the anxiety projections that you're probably already running in your head. So you're like, oh my gosh, I could lose money. I could look like an idiot. I My husband could get mad at me, or I could lose my kid's college savings, you know, all these, I might have to move back home with my parents, you know, all these things that you're probably already thinking, just write them down, type them down, jot them down. And then you've got your list of fears. Often what happens when you do this exercise is because those fears are so huge in your head, when you write them down in paper, it makes them much more manageable because you're like, oh, 
is that really it? That's that's what I'm scared of. But then you don't stop there because fears is only the first part. The next is opportunities. So then you put the fears aside, you close the projector, you turn off the projector for a second and you say, okay, but if I do this thing, if I make this first investment, what are the possibilities? What could this open up for me? This is where joy comes in and takes over. Mm -hmm. And she starts to say, oh, these are all the amazing things that could happen in your life. You, this might be the first in a whole series of investments that you could make. This could put you on the path to retiring early. This could help you triple your kids' college savings. This could help you buy more houses or move to that place that you've always wanted to live in. All these possibilities that have been squashed because your fear projections have been so huge in your mind. So that's the opportunities. That's the second part. And then the third part is this part is the part where you focus on you. And because a big part of making your investment, your first investment, yeah, it's about the money, but really it's about investing in you, yourself, your own possibilities, your own skill set, your own knowledge, your own wisdom. And so that third part is listing out your strengths and reminding yourself why you are so capable of doing this thing. I'm pretty good with numbers or I've, I'm all, I always do my dil due diligence before I get into something. I always bounce back even when I fail. I believe in myself. All these strengths that it are hard to remember when you're scared of something, but it's good to, this is why you're dividing it into three equal sections, because then you look at that paper and you say, okay, I have these fears. I acknowledge them, but guess what? Look at all these opportunities that I have. If I get out of outside of my comfort zone and I try this thing, and here's why I believe in myself, why I think I can do this. And by doing this, you give yourself, you really equip yourself to take action. Um, whereas if it continues to swirl in your head, you might be stuck in that analysis paralysis. Wow. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. I, I think it's like your each of those three categories is helping you debunk the first one a bit. And, I, and it's almost like in the frame of like, at least what I need, I need to know that like, oh, no, I got this. I'm good at this. I've done my analysis here. I've it's like that's that confidence piece to remind yourself of, of all of that. It's it's essential to think about that as you make big financial decisions, even little financial decisions um, and remembering, you know, the full picture and not just zooming in on those projections. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like that a lot. Exactly. Well, with that, um, you know, for the listener, know that we are so excited to hear about your journeys, to be here with you as you are learning, as you are growing, whether you are investing for the first time, whether you're creating a budget and starting with those, uh, those basic foundation building blocks, or maybe you're a savvy investor. You've been doing this for many years, but you're looking to build more community, build more confidence and get into even deeper, bigger things and to expand your impact. We're excited to be here with you every step of the way. And if you have a story where you've overcome some money anxiety, um, maybe you're a female, maybe you're a male, but you've just seen how you can look at things holistically like this and how that's given you confidence. We would love to hear your story. We'd love to share it with the listeners. You can send us an email at podcast at goodegginvestments.com. You can either type it out in the email or record something quick on your phone, a voice recording and let us know and send it that way. Um, it's always really helpful for all of us. Again, that community aspect is huge when we can hear that other people are doing these kinds of things too. So, so send us an email again, that's podcast at goodegginvestments.com. And don't forget, if you are looking for a community as you are on your learning journey and uh, taking the reins on your own finances and investing, we are here with you every step of the way. The best way to get connected with us and our community is to join the Good Egg Investor Club. It's free and it's open to all of you, whether you are an accredited investor or not. And that's something we'll teach you all about inside the community as well. You can just go to goodegginvestments.com slash invest. And by the way, on the next episode of the Life and Money Show, we're going to be talking about a 
very, very interesting phenomenon called HIFI. H-I-F-I, it stands for High Income Financially Insecure. Seems like an oxymoron, right? Somebody who's got a lot of money, but why would they be financially insecure? And we're going to tease that apart. All has to do, I mean, it's tied together with exactly what we've talked about here with wealth transfer and all the emotions, all the things going on in our heads around money. So tune in next time for more with us on the Life and Money Show, the show all about helping you to create a meaningful and intentional life by design. And remember that your financial journey is a lifelong adventure, and we're here with you every step of the way. Thanks for listening.